Um, let's get started. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for attending this talk. My name is Avesto Jetty. I'm a PhD student at the University of Illinois at Arbonne Champaign. Um, this work, uh, Leave Your Phone at the Door, Side Channels That Reveal Factory Secrets, uh, was possible from the help of some of my colleagues, um, Anquet Hari, Katrina Stockman, um, Edward Chu, Kushgar Megna, and Thigo Mu. Um, my primary advisor was uh, Professor Carl Gunter, um, as well as my co-advisor, Professor Mariana Wensled, and Professor William King from Mechanical Engineering. So um, Steve Jobs said that good artists copy, great artists will steal. Um, probably some of you are aware of, of the recent hacks that has happened, supported by some of the nation states. Um, Ex-NSA director just admitted that China has hacked um, every major corporation in the US. Um, or Homeland Security has said that cyber attacks on manufacturing spike tremendously last year. Um, but what are the reasons behind this? Um, if they're able to design new things um, and create it, why are they going to steal? Let's take an example. Um, what you're seeing here is the picture of F-35 Lightning um, fighter jet. Um, Professor Hallman actually mentioned this yesterday in regards to the blueprints of it being um, stolen due to not having an encryption. Um, this was a multi-billion dollar um, project, but uh, what you see here is, is two pictures from two different um, copies of the same jet. I will leave it up to you to decide which one is the real one. Um, if you want to decide. But at the end of it, you know, 50 terabytes of blueprints were out and this project was a failure. The replica was out before the actual design will, um, will be released. So what happens in today's manufacturing? Um, why do I bring the manufacturing and the fighter jet up? The fighter jet is actually made out of 15,000 different parts. It's quite important to have all of these parts to, to be um, connected together. So in a manufacturing floor, which is in charge of putting all these parts together, we have transparency into the supplies factors, meaning that starting from the first parts, which might be a screw, to parts of this jet, we are looking at the factories that are supplying this specific parts. Second, we have the connected machines and, uh, and factories, meaning that from factory A to B, um, you need to have some type of connection which allows you to send the design and the fabrication, and then you're able to add them together. Third of all, we have data aggression analysis that comes out of this um, part. So all the machinery on the manufacturing, it generates tremendous amount of data, and this data will be used in order to increase the quality of the parts or find the errors that you have in the same system. And finally, we have the digital link between the design and fabrication. Um, from the time that you start designing a specific part until the moment that you're fabricating it, there's a link that will allow you to uh, look at the process and understand the flaws and then um, make it better for later. Um, as you can see, manufacturing by far will generate more data than government. For example, it's twice as what government would make uh, data. And as I said, this data could be anything. Um, if your machine makes a sound, that could be considered as a data um, because the material that has been used inside that specific machinery will have different um, factors. Therefore, the sound is different and that data could be used to um, change the specific aspects of it. So these are important. Data are out there. But um, what does this mean for an attacker? There are three different scenarios which an attacker can attack a manufacturing floor. Um, first of all is the theft of intellectual property or the process. If I know the design that you have used, and let's call this a secret design for now, or the process that has taken place to make this um, a specific part, then I'm one step um, ahead of the um, actual person who has actually designed it. Second of all is the disruption of manufacturing operation. If I'm able to stop a specific machine from doing certain things, therefore I'm uh, able to stop the whole process and that delay that um, a specific project. And the second wall is a sabotage of products or reputation. In this case, if I'm able to decrease the quality on a specific part, in a case that, let's say, after 10,000 hours, um, this part in F-35 will break down, then I had a successful attack because the quality control wasn't able to go all the way to the 10,000 hour. What we're looking for in this specific talk is the theft of intellectual property or process um, that might take place. So in the rest of this talk, I will go through smartphones or smartest mice. Um, how do we actually use the smartphones or regular phones um, to attack a number of manufacturing devices? And finally, the um, defense that we have proposed, which is partially able to make the attack more expensive. So the smartphone is smart spies. Um, every one of you perhaps has a smartphone, um, and all of these smartphones are coming with a number of different sensors. For example, this Galaxy S6 has about 20 sensors. Um, in a specific, it has an accelerometer, magnetometer, and a microphone, which are the uh, widely used ones. But what happens if an attacker is able to install a malicious uh, application on this phone? Am I able to read the sensor data and then use it for different purposes? 
Well, that has happened in the past. An attacker was able to install a malicious application on this smartphone. Then he's able to read the sensor data and then send it to the uh, mothership, which later can tell you if the user was driving in a specific um, direction or a specific uh, speed. Uh, what music specifically was the user listening to or what was he typing on his keyboard. So this attack has existed in the past and they're showing that despite the fact that sensors are important to have but they're essential, uh, but it's essential to make them secure in order to preserve the privacy of the user and then make it secure for them. So this is actually from my snapshot from three days ago. Um, it was saying that in UK you're not able to wear your um, Apple Watch to the parliament anymore. Um, the reason behind that was state-sponsored hackers were able to breach these devices and record sensitive information. Um, to us, security experts, this is um, definitely possible. If you think about it, there are sensors there. And then you're able to attack them in certain ways and collect the data, um, for example, microphone data, when it was happening in the room. So the attack um, that exists is not only for, for mobile phones, but is for um, smart devices like a smartwatch, which has a number of sensors on it as well. So what happens to our attack scenario? Then coming back to the manufacturing again. I explained that you have a design and then you have a material that you need to add this two together in order to generate it, uh, a specific part. So when these two are going together, they're going inside a manufacturing process. This manufacturing process includes a number of machinery. And eventually you're able to receive this complete part. Here it might be an airplane uh, or it could be a pencil. What we understood is if you are able to place a number of sensors around this manufacturing process or the machinery, we are able to collect the data that has been generated by this machinery and then later we are able to do the reconstruction and eventually we are able to receive the design and process at the same time. By that I mean I'm able to reconstruct the whole design which might be again uh, a parts of airplane as well as knowing that what machinery specifically has been used to do this process. So um, looking at that manufacturing process, um, what happens, we're looking at a 3D printer here. And the reason that we include this as a part of the manufacturing process is um, there is lots of prototyping that needs to take place inside a manufacturing floor. The reason is um, cost and then the timely matter of that is important as well. This 3D printer, for example, here could be used to make uh, a gun. This is a lower receiver of an AR-15. This is the only part that you need to have uh, uh, license or background check for in the United States to purchase. But if I have a 3D printer, I'm able to just make that. This could be for anything else as well. Um, what we're looking at here is a CNC mill. This is a machine that it will use to uh, cut certain things, metal for a specific. The term for it will be used is milling. I'm milling a specific part. And same as a 3D printer, you're able, for example, making a gun. This is a 1911. You're able to cut it in your basement and you're able to use it. So um, the scope of making different parts with this device is obviously very broad um, and you can make different parts with it. So for our thread model, what we looked at is, let's say you have a part that it will start from a 3D printer. Um, from this 3D printer, you'll start cutting it, then you will send it to the CNC mill to shape it better, and finally it will go through a uh, quality control with the imaging system. In a specific, we understood that you're uh, able to look at the data for example, sound or magnetic field that has been generated by this two device. And then you're able to collect those via two different ways. One is if you have a malicious um, phone installed or is on the manufacturing floor, and then you are able to collect the data. Or second is uh, if you have an employee who will walk in, who will make a phone call while one of this machinery is being run. So that's where we are distinguishing between a smart device and a non-smart device via that phone call. So what would be the attacker's goal? Um, what you're looking at here is the B-52's outline. Um, this is a, a stealth um, bomber that we have. What you're looking at here is the CAD model. What happens in the CAD model is you need to have the design. You're putting it inside um, this application that is able to make a specific code that they call G-code for manufacturing, which later you're able to feed it to the 3D printer. And then finally, you're able to print this outline of this specific um, model that you have. For the attacker's goal, what attacker is looking for is to be able to receive this part, which is a reconstructed one. As you can see, both of these original reconstructed are, are very close in the outline shape. And that's what happens here. Um, later I will explain how we have done the attack, but I need to emphasize on this that we are collecting the, the um, outline of this specific uh, model that we have made. We are not uh, doing the reconstruction based on the G-code, uh, which makes a huge difference and you will understand shortly. So experimental setup. How do we do this specific experiment? As you can see on the left hand side you have the 3D printer and then you have a CNC mill to the right of that. Now we have a smartphone, we just simply placed it on the phone. We haven't changed anything. 
Um, for instance, the microphone is collecting 44,100 samples per second. That's the standard and the default one. And then we have placed it in an angle that is able to have some reading for the magnetometer. Um, in the practical attack, actually, you can place it anywhere as long as you're able to collect some sound. So how do we actually use a smartphone and regular phones to do the specific attack? Um, our first understanding was let's collect the sensor data and see what we can find out. This is the accelerometer sensor data, as you can see. Um, the patterns are quite obvious. We are able to see the direction of the 3D printer's head that it was moving. Was it moving right, up, down, or left? Um, same thing for the magnetometer. We were able to find a specific pattern for the 3D printer's head as well as the CNC mill's head to see what direction these heads are moving. Um, at the beginning, this probably doesn't sound that interesting, but if you're knowing the direction that this um, 3D printer's head or the uh, CNC mouse head was moving, then you can have an understanding of what shape specifically it was going to uh, produce at the product. So now we start looking at the microphone. We said, if you're able to look at the magnetometer and accelerometer and find the direction that is traveling, are we able to specifically look at the angles? What you're looking at here on the left-hand corner is the um, printer's recording. We start recording uh, a specific shape that we are printing. For example, this is a wing that we printed out. And then we recorded the sound that this printer was making while it was making this uh, recording. What you're looking here as a spectrogram is uh, frequency on the y direction and the time. As the time passes, you can see different um, patterns that this specific printer was making. For example, the angle um, A and B are completely obvious on the spectrogram. Same uh, process was happening for the CNC mill. We start recording the sound on the CNC mill and uh, for the same shape uh, being milled out. And then we found the same patterns. We were able to distinguish between um, CNC mill and 3D printer, as well as saying that the specific shape that it was going to be printed out by a specific um, error range. Um, now we are looking at another CNC mill example. What you're looking at on the bottom line is uh, CNC mill doing a specific cut without any speech happening in the room. Um, some of you might know, but on the manufacturing floor, there's lots of noise that might take place. And this noise uh, is definitely in the range of a human speech noise. Um, therefore, it might make it kind of hard for the attacker to be able to collect the specific machinery sound. Um, the second image that you're looking at um, is the same machine doing the same print, but there's a speaker in the room that is talking a regular dialogue, and therefore, there's some background noise. But at the same time, still you're able to see some pattern that takes place from the print. And then finally, we have a, the speech specifically at the microphone, meaning that the user holds the phone, they are talking while this CNC mail is doing its, uh, its milling act. And again, you're able to see some type of pattern that takes place for that specific milling. Um, you're able to do the noise cancellation, obviously, um, and then get the specific pattern that you're looking for. So looking at the microphone, we looked at two different samples. We said, if you're able to see a wing, then what are the easier shapes that we can actually produce in order to make our uh, call it library for now? We start recording a square, circle, and triangle. Um, again, what you're looking at is a frequency on the y axis and then time on the x axis. But the difference here is that on the first image, um, what we see is the 3D printer's head, which is in charge of the speed of the 3D printer to move, or the CNC mail, is moving at a quite fast speed. This is at 30 millimeter per second. Therefore, we are not specifically able to see the pattern that takes place. And the second one is at 22 and a half uh, millimeter per second. And finally, if you put it all the way down to 15 millimeters per second, you're able to see a specific pattern. For example, the middle image here shows a pattern for circle or for triangle and square that are quite look the same, um, but the angles are different if you're doing the processing on them. So what happens for the attacker's face? If we know that we are able to uh, generate different shapes, then we need to have a library that includes all of these shapes, but that's uh, quite exhausting because there's many shapes out there that you need to do. But we came up with a way that we are able to collect only one set of data and make this library generation. After doing the library generation, we need to find the overlapping frames, um, which includes every single angle that this 3D printer has actually printed on. Then we are able to produce the magnitude spectrogram for that specific library that we have collected. Finally, we will do some normalization with respect to the background noise. Um, as I mentioned, there is some background noise. We are using um, STFD um, in order to clean that background noise. Then we will retain the relevant frequency that we have found from the specific library that is important for us. And eventually, we are able to do the library matching with whatever recording that we might have. 
So this might look quite interesting. Um, this is uh, what they call a fan in a, in a manufacturing floor. Uh, but what actually it is, this is a calibration pattern that takes place on a CNC mill and on a 3D printer. Every time that you would like to print something and you want it to be super precise, you're going to have a calibration pattern. So as an attacker, attacker can be on a manufacturing floor, ask the user to just do a calibration pattern, which is not an attack, but then it starts collecting the sound that has been generated by this printer. What happens in the calibration pattern is you will have every single one degree that a printer is able to produce. If you're able to collect every single one degree and record it, and then if you are able to distinguish between different degrees, you have a full library that you're able to do the matching with. So the idea is to have this library, and finally you're able to get the CAD model out of this library. Um, so the library, this is the printed, this is the spectrogram of the library that have, uh, we have printed out. We did exactly the same thing. We did a calibration pattern on the um, 3D printer. Again, you're looking at the normalized frequency and then angle values on the um, x-axis. As you can see for the, for the fan, we have some specific patterns that you're able to look at. Same thing uh, takes place for the CNC mail library. You're able to see a specific pattern um, that it takes place for the same fan that has been uh, printed or has been calibrated for that specific object. But what happens here? We understood that you're able to print the angles, but there's a problem. The problem is that every single angle has a mirror. You have four different quadrants on this specific um, 3D printer or on a CNC mill, and every single angle will actually have 15 different mirrors, not uh, only in its same uh, quadrant that is placed, but is on three different quadrants as well. This is where the magnetometer data will help us. If you are able to understand where the printer's head is sitting in four different angle, um, quadrants, then we are able to tell you which specific angle was being used. The magnetometer data is not necessarily to have, but it will help us um, to achieve the final reconstruction in half a time. Let's say we don't have the magnetometer data. How are we able to understand that, um, which angle specifically was taking place? That's quite simple for this specific object. What we did, we start making a framework and we start using the user um, to help us uh, understand which angle specifically was being used. Let's say we have a uh, mystery image and this is a spectrogram for this mystery image that we have collected. Um, the area of interest are being marked here. If the user sits and he says, well, I see 10 different specific angles, so the shape that is going to be printed out perhaps has 10 different angles on it, I'm going to input number 10 in the framework that I have, and then I will wait for it and see if there is any uh, meaningful shape that it will come out of it. I need to note here that a meaningful shape for the 3D printer is a shape that has the same start and the end position. As you can see here, this shape doesn't have the same start and end position, therefore it will be rejected. What user can do can start playing with those numbers and say, well, I'm going to put um, eight angles right now to see what will happen in the specific um, angles that I might have. So what happens to the reconstruction result? If the user sits down and you give it a number of shapes, is there any way that they can accurately regenerate the same, um, same image? What you see on the top is a star, and the user that we used here, they already knew what shape was going to be reconstructed. So they had a specific idea of number of angles that they had inside this shape. So the result was showing that um, on the star, which is not a mystery shape, as I said, they knew what it was, with the error of 1.1 degree, they were able to reconstruct the same image um, and make the same design out of it. The second image was either reconstructed of a mysterious gun. They did not know uh, what the shape was, but they never saw it before. They only had the library. They started reconstructing it, but the finishing angle for this, which is the end, which is start and the end of the 3D printer's head, was quite far. Um, that number is not that important because, again, you're able to see the overall image of this mysterious shape. Um, now we're looking at the mysterious shape for the B-52. Same thing took place here. Um, the user, again, had no idea what the object might be. They had no idea about number of angles that they had, but they were able to see the spectrogram and then mark the specific angles that they're looking at. Here, the finishing um, result for this, the end gap, is 4.23 millimeters. Again, this number is quite low. As long as they know the number of angles, they can have a layover of the overall um, object that has been printed. So I explained previously that intellectual property and the process are two things that we're able to steal. But what, what we just saw was a reconstruction of that IP or intellectual property. 
are we able to distinguish between two different machineries? You are able to make the same product in a CNC mill and a 3D printer. What you're looking up here uh, on the left is the wing that we have printed with a, three, uh, with a 3D printer. On the right hand side, we have the spectrogram that has collected the data using microphone again. You have the frequency on Y axis and then time on the X axis. And what you're looking in the bottom picture is a CNC mill doing the same cut. It might not be that obvious to you that how different these two images are, but if you start noticing, you can see the pattern for these two is different. The first pattern that you're looking at on the upper picture shows the movement of the 3D printer's head not in a very smooth motion because the motors that has been used in the 3D printers are step motors. Therefore, you're seeing some different steps that it might take place. On the lower picture, on the other hand, since the um, CNC mill doesn't use a step motor and it's just a continuous motor, you're able to see a better um, angle taking place. Therefore, distinguishing these two machines can help the attacker to understand what machine they can use for the reconstruction. So attack was easy. You're able to collect some data using a microphone. If there's magnetometer, you're able to use it. But if there's none, it's still you're able to reconstruct. But what can we do to make this attack more expensive? Um, in order for us to make this attack more expensive, we did the following. We start printing 10 different shapes or 10 different blades. We start recording the sounds of these 10 different blades. And we started adding all the uh, 10 different sounds together and produce this sound which includes number of recording. What you're looking at on the spectrogram, again, is the frequency and the time. And then these are the 10 different shapes that we have, uh, same shapes and the different speeds that we have printed out and we have added together. This might not be, again, interesting. I mean, you just collect a number of sounds, but what can you do with the sound that you have recorded from some of the angles that you have had? Um, in the partial mitigation, uh, we are able to add the sound to the background of the initial, pro uh, initial product that we are going to make. We are going back to the library that we had. Um, this is the spectrogram of the library that we have generated. The shapes are quite obvious. And what you're seeing here is the same library plus the sound that we have added to that. As you can see, um, you're not able to distinguish the specific shapes that we had. It's quite um, scrambled. If you're a motivated attacker, obviously you're able to do some noise cancellation, specifically looking for the frequency range, and therefore you're able to get some of that data out. And uh, that's why we are mentioning that this, is, uh, this, uh, this defense is mostly to make the attack more expensive. Um, some attackers might try it for five times. Some might be more precise and take a uh, longer time to try this. Therefore. Adding this is able to just make the attack expensive and not making it impossible. In conclusion, what we learned is uh, manufacturing equipment will generate tremendous amount of data. Um, sound, magnetic field, the data that has been generated by these motors could be used for different purposes. Um, smartphones are one of the many enemies for additive manufacturing. Um, the data that we have generated took place uh, at a place in Chicago, which is an actual manufacturing. We were able to put the phone down and collect some data at the same time. Um, they demonstrate this attack showing that we can identify and reconstruct an IP intellectual property as well as different devices uh, on a manufacturing floor. And finally, we provided a method uh, to make the reconstruction more expensive for an attacker. With that in mind, uh, I thank you, and if there's any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer it.